Jonathan, good to see you. It's me, good morning. All right. Yeah. Uh, in a mana, in a row, I row rangatira ma tena kato kato. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to come before you this morning and talk about the Civic and International Relations uh, Activity Management Plan uh, for the upcoming LTP. Um, we're a small team uh, with four, four of us plus one, plus one being uh, my administrator. Um, Last year, as you will see, uh, or as you will have seen in the document, we delivered 197 engagements. Uh, and doing the math, that's about 50 each, uh, or about four engagements a week. Um, I think most of you around, uh, around the table here are well aware of what civic and international relations do, uh, as we have touch points with, uh, with most of you. Um, I've been involved in uh, a number of LTPs over the years, uh, and the first one of those that I did um, when we were doing the planning about 10 years ago, uh, the Civic and International Relations budget was $250,000 more than what it is today. So the key thing there is that over successive LTPs, we have managed to uh, strip out most of the uh, discretionary spending uh, and get rid of things that we that we didn't need to do uh, to be left with what we are, have got today. Um, I am uh, proposing some minor amendments to my levels of service. Do you want to pull the slides up to that point? Not there, sorry. Um, the, minor, uh, the minor changes I'm making are generally editorial uh, in nature. However, I am proposing uh, in the civic events to drop the apprentice graduation. Uh, that is because uh, time has moved on. Uh, previously, um, apprentices didn't receive a graduation, uh, but under changes with uh, Te Pukenga, uh, they have absorbed the ITOs and now that sits with them rather than for us to uh, have to pick up. Uh, that's all I'm proposing to talk about uh, here uh, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions or comments. Right. Yanni, uh, please. Is, is there an international relations annual work program? Like, I'm just mindful of those of us who have been involved in the development of the strategies and the Yes, and I, I, I briefed council on that uh, back in uh, May uh, on, on that program, uh, and there is a piece of work outstanding on that. But as I've mentioned, we're a small team delivering a lot of engagements, so the capacity of being able to circle back on that has been delayed. Right. I guess what all I'm trying to understand, though, is what, what in terms of the, that plan, is the LTP supporting or not supporting? Do we know? Or is it possible to get visibility of that? I mean, obviously, maybe not today, but certainly as we go through, I think it would be helpful. So in the levels of service that you'll see on the slide in front of you, there is the lead citywide coordination and collaboration support of the agreed visions and priorities set out in the IRPF action plans. So this is a broad strategic document, whereas that is getting into the operational, uh, the operational uh, part of the delivery. Uh, and uh, it is our intention that we will deliver that annually to, to the council for consideration. Okay. Sorry. It's, yeah, carry on. Carry on. What, sorry, what I'm trying to understand though is are there things in that policy framework in terms of the action plans that we, whatever reason, are, are, are struggling to deliver, need extra revenues to deliver or are not going to deliver? And if so, when do we get visibility as part of the LTP over that? Like, I mean, the Antarctic stuff is, you know, something I mean, like, really supportive of, and, and maybe there's further opportunities there that we, we, we might like to invest more. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, I guess I'm just trying to sort of understand that the process around 
that those strategies and action plans informing the LTP rather than the LTP informing them? Uh, well, I don't really have any answer other than what I've already provided you, uh, Councillor Johansson, um, but I, I think I'm trying to understand with what you're saying. Uh, one of the areas that may well have a impact on resourcing will be if we have to establish an additional sister city uh, based on decisions the council has yet to make uh, on the Pacifica uh, area. But that is subject to a separate piece of work uh, that has yet to be done. Thank you. Okay. I'm really interested to understand more on and well, to look at what resourcing would be required. One, one thing that um, is very uh, clear to me that we do get asked, and, and Duncan has told me from time to time, is if people queuing at the door wants to be our sister city, um, we do not need any more because they do cost a few bob to go and see. We're better off to hang on to the ones that we've got and relish, like Kar Karashki we went to is 50 years. That's been a very long time in the building. We don't need another 10 that we don't do justice to any of them because they do cost a lot of time and effort. And the other thing is that since I've been there, you realise that um, the that Duncan's team that is the furthest from a nine to five job than you've ever got. I had Melinda down at um, Diwali yes, on the weekend. And so that, that's his own time. The, the time is all over the place. And as, as Pauline knows, um, citizenship ceremonies, it, there's, a, there's a hell of a lot of work that goes into doing that. So that there's a lot on all the time. And I never knew any of this before I got sitting here. So uh, <coughs> thank you for your um, presentation. Any other questions? Yeah, honey. Um, just my fault, like we've got the coronial in inquiry happening and I'm just sort of trying to understand where that support for that comes from. Does it come from civic and international relations? Uh, no, it's not It's not from us. That's uh, from Mary Richardson's group where that comes from. Okay. Part of the community services team are helping. Right. That. I mean, just because of the international flavour to it, um, is that something that we should be thinking about, or is that is that more just? Uh, so, in, in instances like that, and indeed any other instance which it doesn't fall squarely in the civic and international relations teams uh, remit, but there is an international dimension, those teams will uh, come and see me for advice, okay. and so that's where we would pr provide advice, but we don't hold the responsibility for the support of of that okay. activity. Thank you. Yeah, and, and one of the things I'll just cast my eye down there, one of everything that you guys do is important, but I don't know whether everyone realizes how important our Antarctic relations are to all the other um, countries we go to. I went to South Korea, saw them, the amount of, um, and the other countries that come here, but especially the United States of America, what they contribute to the whole city as a whole, and that is all funneled through Duncan's group. So, um, um, Aaron, please. Yeah, have we considered instead of like the sister cities relationship when you have cities knocking at the door, and especially those ones that are coming through the Antarctic program, that we don't do like trade partnership cities and have and even use leverage Christchurch NZ and the mayor's office to open the door and then start up those trade delegations. And so we have our, our friendly trading partners. Is, is that an angle we can take? Uh, certainly it is. So a good example of that would be our relationship with Busan uh, in South Korea. Uh, that is uh, not a sister city relationship, but we do have an MOU uh, to cooperate on Antarctic matters. And that includes the, um, the business side of Antarctica, uh, as well as the science and the, uh, and the international uh, dimension of it. Does, does, do those relationships have an official name or is there a... It, 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 it would just be a, 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 an MOU. That's, right. that's what we would call it, mm. as opposed to categorising it as a friendly city or a sister city or anything like that. Right. And is there a way to expand those relations? Because there's clear, measurable benefits. Uh, so we're always looking at that, particularly uh, in regards to the focus areas of the international relations policy framework, uh, which is South Korea, it is Australia, West Coast USA, uh, and Pacifica and I and, and um, China, uh, the Pearl River Delta of China. So in those areas specifically, and that was agreed upon citywide uh, as the key areas of focus. But uh, 
if there is a key Antarctic relationship to be had, then uh, we, we, we take note of it. So, so the, the big growth, is, if you don't mind, Mr. Mayor, the big growth going forward would appear to be India, given that they are overtaking China as the largest country, the largest doc democracy in the world. We have a strong relationship, especially through cricket, although not so much after the weekend, but um, it, it, we're still friends. Uh, and so that would seem to be the big growth. And should Christchurch not try and be the leading trade city with India before someone else takes that spot? Uh, so you make a good point. But the uh, when time comes for us to overhaul the international relations policy framework, that'll be certainly something that will be uh, looked at. But at the moment, uh, the agreed areas uh, of focus were the ones that I've already mentioned. So when's that? change potential? Uh, I don't know if it's on my head. I'll have to circle back to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Kelly, please. Yeah, thanks for that, Duncan. Um, I think you guys do amazing work. Just uh, in terms of capacity, um, what are the ramifications of, say, changing a sister city relationship, like with Christchurch uh, UK? I mean, do we get a lot out of that? And perhaps substituting in, uh, you know, a, a place in India? <clears throat> Uh, so uh, the, the, the relationship we have with Christchurch UK is 50 years old. It is our second oldest sister city. Uh, and I think that the level of engagement that we have with Christchurch is commensurate with the distance uh, and the disparity in the size between us much larger and them much smaller. But what I would say is that the uh, relationship is active uh, and that it is our only toehold in Europe. And that does provide for wider European engagement through having that, uh, that relationship. But uh, if we were to look at substituting a relationship, uh, that would be something that we'd have to consider extremely carefully because I don't, uh, I don't want to come and recommend to council that we sacrifice 50 years of a relationship unless we have an extremely good reason. Okay. Thank you. So, Jonathan, you're next. Are you, buddy? No. Okay. Righto. Good on you. So Thank you. we've got John Fasal next. Uh -huh. No, I just had to get this into the government. Oh, it's government. So, yeah. So it's government chat. So it'll be Helen and John. Yeah. yeah. No, that's right. So I thought it was. Yeah. Greetings. <laughs> uh, thank you, Phil. The, uh, Helen and I will be doing a, uh, a wee bit of a, a, an, an interchange. The governance and decision making, uh, most of this will be very, very familiar. A summary of what the activity delivers. <clears throat> we uh, hold elections. The uh, representation reviews, uh, polls. We provide smart secretarial services, information to support council and community board committee decision making at a, uh, a governance level. The uh, probably one of the, the main changes that uh, Helen will discuss in more detail is an increase in the investment in uh, governance uh, capacity. Over 800 meetings, 2,700 reports overseen, live streaming of 600 meetings, 3,000 applications for uh, and related hearings to district licensing. The, uh, it's quite an extensive citywide activity uh, and it largely happens. It's directed by statute, but it's also directed by community. I'll come to that in a tick. So why do we do this? I mean, obviously, outside of the legal requirements, just a, a passage from Council Strengthening Community Strategy that we find relevant. Participation, engagement, and understanding decision-making processes by our diverse citywide and localised communities build social capital, increases resilience, and results in better decision making as close as possible to the communities affected by the decisions made. Uh, yeah, that's really the why. And if I've just 
bear with me. See the graph on the uh, top left hand side. That is our, uh, our our key visual, our key metric, our thing that keeps us uh, uh, honest. So the, uh, very briefly, uh, changes to uh, previous activity plans. This plan, uh, we are focusing on greater transparency, live streaming of meetings, recording of meetings, less decision making in PX review, and an important and importantly, a commitment to actively review decisions made in PX to see if they can be released. And just to touch on the proposed new level of service about building governance capacity, as you know, currently member development is uh, dealt with in a policy which is member led and an entitlement for uh, an allowance. This year we have already delivered some uh, supports to governance that have uh, with your off-site meetings, as well as a chairperson training that was available to all members who wish to attend. So I'll be coming back to you with some different options about how going forward we can better support governance capacity. Um, this is an increasingly complex world for democratic institutions, and it's important that all members uh, have the right training tools and support in order to be able to uh, make the best decisions for the communities that they serve. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Going back to the uh, the uh, graph on the, uh, uh, the 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 top left, the uh, the teal coloured uh, line the uh, tracks the percentage of our community that understand how council makes decisions. So the last resident survey in May, that was 35% of us. The year before that, it was 31. So we are tracking high 20s to, uh, to mid 30s. That's a key metric for us because it embodies effectiveness, efficiency, localism, uh, transparency, a bit of trust. The, uh, so we, uh, we follow that carefully and, uh, you know, our, recommend that you support levels of service to uh, to increase that over time. Interestingly, if you the uh, in your own copies, if you just look at the commentary underneath, the uh, whilst we have 35% of general residents who understand how council make decisions, that increases to 45% of people who've actually interacted up with us understand how council make decisions. So generally speaking, the people who interact, even if they're not looking for, you know, don't get the decision they were perhaps hoping for, once they engage with us, you, they tend to have a greater uh, uh, understanding. Very, very briefly, the, this plan does not propose any uh, changes in the, the quantity of service or the cost. We, uh, as, as Helen said, we slowly reprioritize uh, over time. Uh, taking our lead uh, uh, from you the, uh, and from our communities. The, uh, just a couple of the risks and challenges that we, we see. Council are uh, about to embark on some difficult decisions. The, uh, that, uh, that can impact. The, uh, uh, we're also picking up an increase in aggressive behaviour and abuse targeted towards particularly our elected members. So we're keeping a, uh, an eye out on that and providing support at a, uh, a council and at a, a community board level. Helen, is there anything else you'd like to... No, I think that's good, John. Yeah. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, Sarah Booz. Thank you, and thanks for addressing the um, elected member of development because I was going to ask about that. Um, so two quick things. Does this area cover the representation review? Or is that more in the... That's yeah. that's not for the life of this long term plan. It the is. representation re review is after the next election. But the yeah, but the long term plan is ten years, and if we don't budget for the next one in four years' time, then there will be a budget increase it's next time around. It, like it, it should be. It, it of, should in, be it should in be. the councillor, but uh, we. Have if focused. you if you look at page seven, uh, uh uh, page seven, year 28, 29, there's a big increase in cost. 
I think that's our that's an elect our, our budget for a rep review and an election. Oh uh, no, see, so yeah. So the the rep review comes in in twenty six twenty seven. That's when that should be happening. So can can we just look at that? Um, because that's the six years from the last one. Um, and also, uh, or 26, 27, 27, 28, it's in that space there. Um, and there's a decrease between the next local government election and the following one. So 25 and then 28. So in 2028, we've got a much lower budget than 2025. And that seems unlikely when it comes to that sorry what was the what year was that elections the, the next two elections we've got yep. a, a budget of um uh, 1.4 million for the next election and then only 1.3 the following election it just seems a little unlikely that's all just if, if we people could we can check that. that yeah thanks i you, yeah, fewer post boxes. I, I don't know. The um, of the rec, yeah, yeah. Okay. but the yeah. other thing is that the um, the organisation now has a legislated role in trying to increase voter participation, and I'm just wondering if we have got a plan in place and appropriate budget for doing that. So if that could be feedback to us, that would be great. All done. Pauline, please. Yeah, thank you. And look, it's good to hear that you're thinking about training for um, governance because I think it's really important, but um, there's no reason budget in there for that. Uh, the plan would be to manage that within existing budgets, and I'll be coming back to you with yeah, options about that. That concerns me because I know that there's already very little in there, really. Um, it, it's, it's not itemised to that level of detail. The, Okay. The budget. Thank you. Uh, what's before you in the activity plan? I mean, yeah. Okay. Any other? Just well, currently, there's an allocated amount per year per elected member, that, but that includes conferences, and if it generally it's enough to go to one conference, probably. There's not enough to really do many courses or anything like that. So I'm just wondering if there needs to be more budget in there. Do Do you really think you can deliver? more training in the existing budget it's about reprioritizing how training is delivered and to look at the needs of all members rather than members self-determining what they individually want to attend right so do more like um group um joined up training like you did the cheers one those those are exactly the options to to bring back for the council to determine so the policy is currently it is an entitlement um, yeah. and provided you follow the process that that training is available to you yep and I know I know this is difficult I know that we, we're running tight budgets here but we need to hear honestly from staff if more budget is required and then it's our decision how to find it or if we find that so if you're confidently saying that you can deliver training within budgets, then that is what I'm hearing. It's about reprioritizing. Okay. The rock is to Yanni, please. Uh, yeah. Then Sam. I wondered if this includes the LGNZ membership or um, because obviously we spend a lot of money on conferences with LGNZ and training as well. And I just wondered if we're looking at that. Um, the second question is, um, can we set a target for voter participation? Because I think that to me seems a bit of a gap that we don't have a target to improve it. Um, and there's nothing I could see in here that looks to address that. So how, just, I'm a bit confused. How would you do voter participation? Well, yeah. well there's many ways you can do it. Um, we've consistently made a lot of suggestions to central government around justice and electoral reform and I don't know where those things have got to um, there's um, the advertising campaigns that we do there's the engagement with young people for example or communities that are less likely to vote so th there's quite a number of things one of the things that I've always been really keen for us to do is support civics education in schools 
um, and work with like government around kids vote, for example. But that obviously requires maybe some resource. And but the key thing is to set a target so that we can work towards improving it, because it's only we've only had very very modest improvements in the last we were. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you. Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe sometimes turn out it's not good. The, uh, <laughs> the, um, the no, we, just, we don't want a reason for it. Anyway, well, this is recorded too, isn't it? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> no. um, the, the only thing I was just trying to understand was around the professional development stuff because um, I'm, I'm not that keen on moving to a model where it's all pulled and we all have to go on the same courses. And, and the reason for that is, and I don't mean this disrespectfully to anybody, is we're all at different stages in terms of our professional careers so some of us do stuff outside of in that and and like for example yanni mentioned around lgnz for example you know i won't go to their conferences so i'm just thinking in terms of um yeah I, i'm just not that keen on moving to a generic we all go and do the same course um you know and that, that kind of thing i'd be more more it should be more tailored to the individual based on needs for example i went and did a uh, principles of uh, Maori governance course the other day and I actually found that really useful because but there are a lot of people around the table that are a lot further ahead in that than I am you know I wouldn't necessarily get that um, if we were just going to do a chairperson's course where I've chaired stuff before so just be keen on your thoughts on how we can make that work because it's in my view I don't know what other people think it should be tailored to the individual if we're genuinely trying to lift you know competency around the table uh, and that's why I'll be coming back with options which include the status quo which is the current policy yeah uh, which is the self-determined model, but to test whether there's appetite to, to look at different ways of delivering that support. But ultimately, that's a council decision because it is a council policy. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Melanie, please. Oh. Sorry, just on that, but Helen's saying you've only got the budget for the group one. You don't have the funds to offer self-determined options currently the council policy is that it is self-determined um and uh i'll be coming back with options to see whether there's appetite to change that policy which would include looking at whether there are group options or not or a bit of a mix of what you have and what it could be but ultimately it's council policy and also just to add to that and ultimately if it's a mix and match or whatever different options you've got what the costs of those are likely to be so members are fully aware and then determine whether there needs to be an increased budget or the same budget or how that's distributed yes yeah okay we're getting a few questions there melanie please um my was just around um more detail on the budgets actually because if something's being prioritized something's being pushed down and it would be good to see more information about it mm -hmm. okay um, Kelly. Yeah, has there ever been any um, attempt to divide out uh, councillors and community boards, you know, uh, expenses and costs for the different parts? Uh, of yeah, the in the breakdowns the, uh, that make up these budgets, they are divided quite specifically. The, uh, however, we work very, very closely together. They, uh, to produce a joined up service because of course, councillors are members of community boards. So, they, uh, so there's a, a degree of uh, a joint effort there, but you can uh, very very uh, easily split, but not at this level, this, this is too high. Okay, um, Jake. Um, regardless of the budget we have on, um, on budget, do we know if all of that's drawn down or if only part of what we have set aside is actually drawn down in any given year? In relation to member de development. Yeah. Uh, so the past three mm. years, there'd been minimal budget due to changes that were made for the COVID years. Um, and we're only partway through this year. I'm just wondering if it's a budget that's actually undersubscribed anyway. It, it's very difficult to say because the past because the three flight. years haven't been drawn down aside from conference. Right. So they're, they're not, we don't have that set pattern. Okay. Interesting. What about historically, Helen, pre-COVID times? I'd have to look into that. I'm afraid I, I don't know. Um, John, like do you... we're, we're, we might be arguing about how much we should put on budget, but it may be that the use is actually not what, because I know I've never tapped into it once. So, you know. Historically, it's slightly it uh, uh, underdrawn down. The uh, for a range of factors, 
but in in recent years the uh there's been a, a, a lot of unreliability and a lot of exceptional circumstances so i wouldn't want to use that history to uh predict the future so we need to do the work tim tim oh. you know um Prior to getting elected, I spent quite a bit on personal development and going on courses myself. So as elected members, you shouldn't just expect to, well, these things to be paid for. Those ones that are going to enhance us as elected members, I think is fair enough, but there's a limit to everything because in another document with the long-term plan, it also says we've got to share the pain and the, and the load. So to, to kind of suddenly think, oh, no, I'm not going to pay for it because it should be paid, I think is pretty short-sighted. The only, the only thing, though, You've got to get it right. Is I, I think it's I think it's fair to deduct it as public money, but where there's a genuine benefit to enhancing the competency around the table, is, is, no, but it's a good thing regardless of what it is. Actually, going and meeting different people and interacting with colleagues that are or people from professions that aren't necessarily here all day, um, is actually a really useful thing for us as well. So, uh, yeah, you, we wouldn't want to be too critical. Every, every organisation I've ever worked in um, is very complimentary about people going and doing professional development because it does bring back value to the business. You may not see it on day one, organisation of business. You could say that you're going to an LGNZ conference, you're seeing the issues from another council that, you know, so, yeah. That's, yeah, I just wouldn't be too critical. It's, it's good yeah. to meet up with um, people who are going through the same problems as us, but seeing how they deal with it. So it's, uh, it's quite helpful. Sarah, please. Yeah, just um, while you're doing that piece of work, Helen, one of the things that we struggle with sometimes is knowing what's happening when it comes to professional development. So when um, I was first elected, there was a lot of LGNZ courses that were run and you could look on their website and see, okay, this one's coming up in Christchurch soon. It's something that would suit me um, and you'd apply to go on it. There's just not that availability of that kind of specific elected member stuff now, um, apart from sort of the webinars and things on, online that we don't get access to because we're not paying for it as a council. Um, but also, you know, relevant conferences and those kind of things. We just don't hear about them. So we don't know that they're happening in a way that we could enhance our, um, our knowledge and, and governance experience and stuff. So a, a, a way to um, find out what's happening and what might be interesting for people would be also really good. Thank you very much. So who's next? So you, Helen, by yourself, is it? Welcome to stay, John. <laughs> Thank As you, Helen. Runs off into the distance. Thank you. So legal services, we're a support service. We provide support to the other business units of the council. We're not a front-facing service. So uh, we help you deliver your priorities. We help the business units deliver their activities as well as managing and supporting um, minimising legal risks to the council. We support all areas um, of the business apart from employment relations which is supported directly by people and culture. And the benefits of having an in-house team is that we're cost-effective because we're not providing profit to partners in an external firm. We know how the council works, we understand the context, um, and, we and that delivers a lot of non-financial benefits. So just a bit of background over the last three years, uh, legal services has been on a journey. Uh, three years ago, we invested to save, to improve the model and provide more of that work in-house. And our level of service is to deliver 75% uh, of that work in-house, and we're pretty close to that right now. Um, we've worked hard to get that balance right, and there's always going to be matters for reason of capacity or competence and skill and expertise. We will need to buy that in um, when it's in the interest of the council to do so. Um, to counter the benefits from investing in the in-house capacity three years ago, which initially we delivered a real reduction of nearly uh, two for every one dollar that had been invested, the like-for-like -like cost of external services has increased over that time by um, up to 20, nearly 25%. So that means I'm looking at how I continue to grow and improve on the internal capacity. And so some of the things that we're currently doing is that uh, we're upskilling a team member to become a licensed immigration practitioner. 
so that they can support all the um, overseas recruitment that's being undertaken across the board, as well as bringing in a lot of the work for Public Works Act, which historically we have always externalised. And we're working in partnership with our external firms who are adding value to upskill the internal teams on that. Uh, and lastly, we've an ongoing piece of work to improve our processes and systems so that we can free up the lawyers to spend more time on uh, the high touch and higher risk work and less time on the lower risk uh, work. So just to address a couple of questions that I've been asked recently, I've been asked, uh, why can't we provide services, say to other councils and why can't we trade? Um, and that is because the Law Society prevents us from doing that. We can only provide legal services to the council and its subsidiaries. Uh, another question I've been asked recently is why do we use lawyers from out of town? Uh, and the reason for that is last year we undertook um, a very thorough new procurement process. We set up four new procurement panels um, where we've appointed effectively the best of breed. And that does mean that some of our lawyers are not based in Christchurch because they are the ones with the skills and expertise that this council needs. And also generally, we are not charged for travel for when those lawyers do need to attend physically in Christchurch. And just lastly, if I can just uh, show you the graph, if I can go back. 86% um, of the users of legal services are satisfied with the service they get. That's been increasing year on year and 86% is the highest since this level of service was put into the activity plan. And that comes from the different parts of the business that use our services. And in particular, they value how we communicate and engage in the relationships that we've established across the business, as well as our ability to deliver on time. So that is the legal services in a nutshell. Right. Yanni's going to ask you a question in a nutshell. Yeah, too. Um, I think, uh, well, first, can I just say thank you for the work that you've done? Uh, you know, I'm really encouraged by what you've shared with us today about the change. I, I, I think for those of us that were here for a long time, like we really were getting quite concerned at the high cost of the external legal advice. And so I think hopefully this is a really good model that we can look at other units across council as well, where we are spending a lot on consultants. I just had um, two very specific questions. One is, is it possible in the budget to separate out this, our direct staff costs versus the contract personnel costs? Uh, for legal services, the external costs are listed there as the operating costs. Um, it does have the staff and other uh, contract personnel stuff. That's what it's listed, but we have very few contract personnel. Um, we occasionally will contract in from one of our external firms on a secondment rate to um, cover a vacancy. Sorry, I'm just trying to understand from the, is it the 25% that we're paying to the that, external? That comes out of direct operating costs. Right, okay, and the staffing that we have in terms of internal, is that also in that budget line? That's in the staff and contract personnel cost oh, okay. line. I see. So that's how we look at the difference between the two. Okay. Um, second um, question from me was um, in regards to we can't operate as a service for others, et cetera, but within the CCHL and the council companies, could we provide a service to them? And, or do we do that at the moment? Or if not, can we look at that to reduce costs as well? Uh, no, we don't currently. Um, but that is something that we can look at in the future. Um, it is um, other councils do surprise, provide support to their organisations. Yeah. But currently, that wouldn't we wouldn't have that capacity sitting vacant to fill up by doing the work for the group. Sure. So it would need to be part of a, a bigger plan. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's been raised as part of the CCHL review as well, if we can look at shared service arrangements. So, yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to look at that when the time is right. Yes. Sarah, did you have a question? Yeah, it just kind of follows on from Yanni's. It was going to be Yanni's um, first one over that, um, that external versus internal. I'm just wondering if it's possible to get a breakdown of the um, types of things that we use those external legal services for. Um, yeah. Thanks. It's probably worth doing that over a three-year period because there'll be different things. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do what I can. These are metrics that are not easy yeah. to um, 
to deliver, but I'll, I'll do what I can on that. Thanks. There you go. Any other questions of Helen? Nope. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Okay. So we've got Nick. Nick. Oh, there he goes. Welcome, Nick. Good morning. Thank you. Just run through um, some of the key points um, and then open for questions, I think. Um, so this is the first time um, we'll have the risk and assurance as a unit um, come to council with an activity plan. Um, I've been here for about two years, just a little bit over. Uh, and in that period, um, we've had quite a lot of change in the space and the activities that we do, um, which is predominantly focused on health, safety and wellbeing, which was previously part of the um, people and culture unit internal audit and risk management services. Um, so again, we're, we're an internal supportive enabling service uh, and we also help um, all of council and we do so on a, on a regular basis, um, at least at the heads of service um, level. And we focus in a more projectized way uh, from time to time in different areas. Um, as Helen was describing with the legal services, we're also a cost effective um, service, I think, um, if we're looking at uh, current sort of consulting costs um, per staff member um, week, we'd probably be buying in uh, a single day uh, from an external um, service provider. Uh, so we're probably getting about five times as much value um, simply in dollar terms as far as that um, core resourcing goes. Our focus at the moment, and I'm not proposing any major changes to where we're at, um, comes about through uh, through that combination um, of services that happened. Um, the addition of uh, some additional staff um, where we brought in some people from regulatory compliance who do internal audit. Um, this has been part of bringing these risk-focused services together because mm -hmm. fundamentally the work that these people do is, is the same. Uh, they just have a different focus. Um, so we've been able to bring in quite a range of um, skill sets together, um, which is really effective. So we're in the process of looking at consistently delivering our services, um, consistently supporting the organisation and getting a really clear understanding of council. Um, therefore, I'm not proposing any major changes to where we're at at the moment. Um, we've also grown the health, safety and wellbeing team, um, which is... Uh, been really effective as well at supporting across the organisation as opposed to different areas pulling in specific resources um, for the purposes of projects, for example. Um, we're able to help out with um, site visits, uh, help build awareness across management. Uh, so we're really in the business of um, boosting capability across the organisation and we'll see those benefits increase over time uh, as we do that. Um, <clears throat> We've proposed a couple of levels of service changes. Um, they're internal. Uh, one is around our internal audit activities. Uh, previously, it was that we would do a certain percentage of the plan, so a certain number of activities. Uh, we focused this around uh, the good practice uh, frameworks um, that we need to um, need to uh, follow uh, in order to. Uh, deliver the services as opposed to the specific activities we're going to do and likewise for health and safety. Um, the previous uh, target was around uh, ensuring that we met all of our health and safety obligations but now we're defining that more clearly around uh, the standard so ISO 45001 um, and the uh, external audit um, that we'd expect to have for that. Um, the uh, budget at this stage doesn't include a breakdown of our health and safety um, parts um, because it's a new activity plan. Uh, so we're just going to note there around the total cost there. Um, we're also looking at ways of increasing our efficiency so that we're reducing the administrative costs um, across the organisation, um, which is a primary focus for us. So uh, again, we're not looking for any major increases. Um, we are in some ways still looking at really understanding um, what the true costs are, uh, but I think we're in a pretty good space at the moment. Um, are there any specific questions? Melanie? Um, with the level of service that's deleted, which I think you sort of touched on, but um, it, I 
I don't really understand why it's been deleted, really, because it seems like it was quite good. Um, about, yeah, do you know the one I'm talking um, about? Sorry, which one? So it's on um, page 85 of our briefing agenda, but it's the 13.6.11.1. Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, so that um, focus... Uh, we could probably update the way we've described the new one, um, but that is around how specifically we will achieve that um, through the through the standard and framework. Um, I don't know if I've answered the question. I think the the change from it, it makes it sound like you're going you're going from a or plan out what we're going to kind of. Um, do and we'll respond to stuff in an agile way which yep. i would imagine you would actually do a combination of those two things rather than i mean it's just the way that this reads it's all okay yeah so I'll, I'll certainly go back and have a look at how we've described that thanks thank, thank you um yanni please yeah thanks i'm just uh wanting to understand if you're planning on doing anything um, additional or require additional resource to address the findings of the wastewater treatment plant response, which talked about uh, internal risk registers um, really not not being sufficient um, and seems to be massive gaps in, in the way in which risk was identified, registered, monitored, and escalated. Yeah, great. I think it's a good question. Um, so we, d per se... I don't own risk. Um, we support other parts of the organization projects, business units um, to, to do that. Um, so what we have been doing is increasing our training, um, providing support and oversight um, for projects and, and business areas across the whole council. Um, so I don't see that as something that we need specific additional resourcing for. It's something that I think we will improve over time um, with consistent application of advice. So we have good staff um, who are able to provide that advice. Um, so you so you would do an audit of the risk register in terms of how it relates to different council departments, check if there were things in there that were sufficient or maybe insufficient, and then come up with a sort of action plan to address? That's a, essentially the process that we're undertaking. Um, over, I, I can't remember exactly when, but around a year ago um, or so, we were... Um, mo we moved into doing a quarterly review for each business unit. Right. Um, so that's that's within our existing resourcing to be able to do that. And I guess what I was trying to understand from the activity management plan or the, the levels of service is if we're going to be doing less reviews over a longer period of time, and I'm just looking at page 84, just to try and get a sense of, um, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering how much capacity we have to make sure that those reviews are done in a timely fashion and the recommendations are implemented in a timely fashion. Sure. I think from some of the stuff I've read in the past where high findings and moderate findings have been raised, mm. it still seems like quite a big lag between them getting it addressed. Yeah, so um, thanks. Thank the, sorry? Karen, sorry. Yep. Karen. The, um, if we say that we're going to do a certain number of uh, audits, for example, um, those audits may be small or they may be very large. Um, good practice would suggest that we have a combination of, you know, large end-to-end -end system level reviews, some small reviews, some response reviews, which we'll be doing in line with uh, a business unit, and moving more towards automated um, work, for example. The way the level of service was described would be, uh, say, 75% of the 10 planned audits for the year. That's That's essentially what it was um, that didn't provide the flexibility to uh, do that diversity of work uh, in a way that um, in a way that the world's changing I suppose you know we, we expect to see a lot more um, say AI type work um, around automated financial reviews and so on. Councillor Johansson in terms of the question around high and medium outcomes of recommendations from audit mm -hmm. That is something we have been working on now for four years because there was a very long backlog. We have reduced that backlog significantly. And actually, uh, we get that reported to ELT and into the Audit and Risk Committee. So it is something we monitor very closely, something I think that 
the organization can actually say it owns far better than it's ever done before. Yeah, I guess what I'm really interested in is, I mean, I think having the independence of the audit and risk unit doing the work that they do is really good. And I, I guess I'm a little bit one, well, I guess a little bit concerned the reliance on the units to deal with the risk when we've got sort of experts over here. So I guess that's not, I guess the question I've got is do we have enough independent resource into our audit and risk unit to be able to, con, you know, have the resources required to do that sort of monitoring? So uh, that's not what mm. Nick is saying. And to be clear, we move from having a, a traditional internal audit service, which it was historically, to a risk and assurance unit, including incorporation of health and safety and well-being as an issue of risk and taking activity in relation to that. And fundamentally, the work with the service units is both to strengthen their knowledge and understanding of risk, which is what Nick has just said, for over a year, they've been working directly with the units to really move that on. And we've seen the benefit of that. So it's not that the team is separated out and not engaged. In fact, if anything, they're far more embedded than they've ever been in this organisation. And Nick, I think you might need to bring it more to life to help the council understand the difference that we've been doing. Yes. Do you want me to talk through that now? No, I think that... Getting it... Yeah, it was really just getting an understanding as if we had more of people in your unit, could we alleviate um, or do more around risk reduction? And, and where is that kind of spot in terms of requiring the business units to do the work versus the work that you're able to do? And I, and I mean, you've kind of touched on that, having that flexibility might help. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm never going to argue that I should have less and who doesn't want more, so to speak. Um, but um, uh, fundamentally, we aren't the ones that are responsible for delivering that work. We have to have the units um, doing that. Uh, otherwise, we would lose that independence. And we can't impose uh, new work on those on those units and, and, and dictate to them exactly how something needs to happen. We make recommendations, we make suggestions, and we provide that oversight and support and reporting. Um, and we can um, yeah, brainstorm with them. Yep, great. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, and then Celeste, then Tim. Thanks. Um, just going back to the actual levels of service, um, thing that Mel was talking about. Um, what I liked about the, or the one that's being deleted is that it's um, a little bit more plain language than um, just a reference to an ISO. Yep. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's a way to make this more intelligible for the general public and councillors by by having some wording in the level of service that doesn't just reference the, the standard we're trying to, the number, the number of the standard we're trying to reach. Um, and in that first one, health, safety and wellbeing 13.0.9, the measurement method of measurement as well is, um, it says documented safety man measure, management system. And I'm just um, checking that that's safety and wellbeing and that the wellbeing stuff's measured as well, not just the safety. Um, yes. Um, so in that sense, uh, from, from this perspective, we're looking at um, well, psychosocial harm as a type of safety, type of harm. Um, there is a, it is incorporated within that. Um, but I definitely take your point. I've made a note around the plain English uh, to make sure that it's explicit. Yeah, yeah. and if we yep. could just um, maybe change the wording of the method of measurement stuff as well. Yes. Um, because we need to make sure that that well-being space is is captured appropriately. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, Celeste, please. Um, kia ora. I'm just going to question about the difference between workers and contractors, subcontractors. Mm. Uh, are we capturing risk to contractors, and by which that would include uh, councillors and elected members? Because I understand that there's been a recent case with um, Fukati Island where there are some significant health and safety implications. Have we done a, an analysis of what we need to do now? And do we have a risk register for things relating to people that aren't classified as workers? I'm going to say, Very complicated question. No, that's but, okay. Yeah. Um, so I would say yes and no. No in the sense that there is always unknown stuff out there. And we, uh, you know, like I was saying before, around consistency. And we do still have a relatively uh, new team. 
uh, in particular in health and safety, and they are developing their ways of working um, across the organisation. And they're not going to stop doing that because we're focused on continuous improvement within our team and to support continuous improvement across the organisation. Um, in terms of identifying risks, yes, across the organisation, those health and safety risks are identified. However, this is always going to remain a key focus for us. And at the moment, am I completely satisfied that we have every key risk identified for staff, um, you know, other people, um, such as contractors? No, we don't. Um, we are focused on identifying what they are and collecting information about events and incidents. Um, and we do need to do some work around our systems and processes to ensure we have consistency and visibility of those things. Follow up. At some point, can we get a bit of an update on the work around the contractor space? Because I'm aware of the work around the worker space a bit more, but I haven't heard anything in relation to, because we did have a discussion around the risk register for contractors, um, and I'm not aware of where that's gone. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thank you. And lastly, at the moment, Tim. Yeah, just to, um, with regards to the new um, uh, committee members, independent committee members on the Health, Safety and Wellbeing Committee and also on the Audit and Risk. So there's a really high level of expertise with them, which they're stuck, which we are cross-pollinating, obviously. So as Nick said, uh, some areas are newer than others, but we're really getting some speed on there. And, but it's crucial to do it properly. So. Great, thanks very much. Well, we're actually slightly ahead of time, so we'll have a break now, and I'll get Mark uh, to come back and meet us. So, we can have a call. That's 10 to 11, Phil. Yeah, 10, 10, 10 to 11, yeah. Yeah, sorry, Toro, I didn't have my button on. That's what it is.